Welcome everybody uh, to the third of the crash impact events for Michaelmas involving the work of, of Michael Pullet, the professor of Chinese uh, from Har Harvard. And as you know, we like to make things slightly more dynamic, if not positively aggressive and inter interactive. And so today we're going to be running a conversation. And uh, I can introduce to you, and you can probably work it out, uh, I mean, so, <laughs> Michael, so you know that the other man is Hans Van Der Ven, professor of Chinese here. And, and the non-man And the non-man <laughs> oh, oh, oh. and, 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 and our distinguished <laughs> professor from London, <laughs> Julia Lovell, who will be taking uh, uh, either side of Hans, who is going to chair the meeting. Okay. Let me pour some water, first of all, for Michael, and I will do the same for oh, you. Thank you. I have some. Yes, thank some. you. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say very much, just to sort of to outline uh, how we're going to do this. We'll start, uh, sort of my job here is to keep these two warring factions apart. <laughs> so if I end up as a sort of fumbled heap, then you blame them, <laughs> not me. Um, we'll begin off with, I'm going to raise a few questions which I think are sort of interesting to everybody generally, very broad questions. Uh, and then Julia and Michael uh, will debate this. Uh, and then after I've done that for... 20, 30 minutes or so, uh, we want you uh, to join us uh, and ask all kinds of questions related to the topics we have discussed or not. Uh, and the idea is to this is a time to really press people for serious answers, serious questions about serious issues. Uh, that's what we do at Cambridge after 6 o'clock. Uh, I then, uh, outside the classroom on the whole. So I begin uh, with the first question that I, I thought of. Um, and I think we all know, and just to relate things to today, uh, in the Western press, uh, as you know, uh, President Xi Jinping's appointment to a second and perhaps not final term as party secretary an elevation of his ideas to the level of theory uh, that should be seen as a significant contribution to Marxism in the 21st century has led to him being compared to Deng Xiaoping, to Mao. Uh, other comparisons have been made in the Western press to various other people like Sisi or Modi or, may I say, Trump. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. I, I've just been wondering to what extent those are the right comparisons to make, or are there things from history, from Chinese history, we can draw on that are actually more illuminating uh, in understanding what Xi Jinping is trying to achieve and the way that he does it. Uh, and I think we'll first turn to London. Okay. <laughs> um, I think if we're going to look at history, I think probably we want to look at China's biggest empires, its sort of baggiest, most um, multi-ethnic empire, so perhaps the, the, the Tang Empire, but more likely the Qing Empire. Um, I think Yongzheng is not a bad comparison in some ways because of his crackdown on corruption and his also his autocratic tendencies, particularly towards the uh, cultural, literary, artistic spheres. But at the same time, I'd be very wary of overstating, of overestimating Xi Jinping's uh, frame of historical reference. Mm. I mean, the Western media has been very enthusiastically running with the idea, both visually and also in terms of his words and his behaviour, that he is a new Mao. Um, I don't think that comparison works exactly. I don't think that analogy works exactly. Uh, it only works if you accept Mao as a kind of living, breathing figure and Maoism as a living, breathing ideology. So you know, Xi Jinping is actually not Mao of the Cultural Revolution, far from it. And the 50th anniversary of the yes. outbreak of the Cultural Revolution last year, obviously, commemorations were extremely muted indeed. So he's definitely not anarcho-Mao. Um, uh, uh, but at the same time, if we look at his background, who he is, you know, he is a man who has uh, been born into, educated by, worked within the party. Um, so if, you, if we're trying to unpack what this thing Xi Jinping thought is, I'm sort of slightly stumped to find innovations beyond the fact that he is really, you know, striking up for party discipline. You know, it's the CCP. 
is the um, central feature in his political landscape. And you've seen that uh, happening since he came to power in 2012 with the anti-corruption campaigns. Very, very, again, if we're thinking about the Maoist comparisons, a very strong, clear return to Maoist rhetoric, rectification, uh, the so-called mass line website. Again, you know, all, all these things, not, obviously not, not the website isn't a Maoist invention, uh, but, but the idea <laughs> of the... <laughs> The, <laughs> mm, um, you heard it here first, um, uh, but but the, obviously the the idea of the mass lines was strongly uh, strong, strongly Maoist rhetoric, um, and I think what's come through if we're trying to identify what Xi Jinping thought is it's you know protection of the party mm. is everything you know he is he's absolutely a man of the party without thinking of him as a creature of the party we cannot even understand the extraordinary contradictions with his, within his own family background because of course his his father suffered badly under Mao and, and Xi Jinping himself was banished to the countryside um, and yet Xi Jinping seems to have very very deliberately and overtly reached for aspects of what you could call the, 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 the Maoist toolkit. Not all the Maoist toolkit, but, but absolutely some of it. And of course, part of that is the cult of Xi Jinping, which we're seeing mm -hmm. emerging, which is getting really quite extraordinarily out of hand. I mean, just a few days ago on primetime CCTV news, uh, I heard that four minutes of the broadcast was devoted exclusively to applause of Xi Jinping. You know, just people applauding Xi Jinping. Uh, and of course, the nomenclature is getting quite out of out line. You know, the, the, the great leader, almost sort of religious in some of its dimensions, the um, sort of highly venerating, respectful language. So I would, I would say that, um, uh, that, that you know, and, the, and the other thing which obviously really concerns Xi Jinping is outliving the Soviet Union. So it's protecting the party reach it and reaching back into the repertoire that the party gives him rather than further back in history. All right, thank you very much. So that's a very strong statement of seeing, seeing Xi Jinping, Mao number two, uh, in, a, in a very sort of CCP framework. So Michael. So I'm going to go very far back in history. <laughs> um, but, but let me begin with the Mao comparison. Um, so it does seem a little odd that Xi Jinping will clearly pick up rhetoric implying a closeness to Mao when overtly they seem to be quite different figures, to put it mildly, as you were mentioning. I mean, here's Mao overtly claiming he is going to wipe out what he explicitly calls tr the traditional world of Chinese society to radically modernize it. Um, this hits its most extreme moment, of course, in the Cultural Revolution, when he explicitly terms what what the object is to be Confucianism. This is going to be wiped out once and for all. He infamously, and I will begin to, to return to your question here, um, compares himself to the first emperor of China when he does so, saying yes, the big difference that. between me, Mao, and the first emperor is I'm going to be more radical and I'm going to succeed. <laughs> so the first emperor burned the books and tried to create a new world, but he ultimately failed. Um, and Confucianism comes back and wins, and I'm going to wipe it out once and for all. Now, it seems a little odd that Xi Jinping would then be picking up Maoist rhetoric because here's someone who, yes, clearly positions himself on the left in the Chinese context, clearly positions himself as a populist figure who will be supportive of the people as, as Mao was. And yet, of course, um, far from trying to wipe everything out, yes, he's wiping out corruption, but he's not calling on the population to you know, beat up party officials. He's, he's trying to build a very efficient, meritocratic bureaucracy, which you know, is not exactly um, Maoist ways of thinking. So um, is there a possible um, earlier um, image that, that perhaps could play into this? Well, let me throw out one possibility. Um, Emperor Wu, Han Wudi of the Han. So a very quick historical background here. Um, we mentioned the first emperor. The first emperor, as Mao correctly noted, um, failed in his overt attempts. I mean, literally, the Qin dynasty failed very quickly. Um, it was followed by the Han dynasty, which was a very, very um, unstable dynasty to put it mildly. And the figure who consolidates imperial rule is Emperor Wu of the Han dynasty. Han Wudi is the other way he's referred to. And the key aspect that Han Wudi did is he explicitly compared himself to the first emperor. But of course, unlike the first emperor, where the emphasis was just radical destruction, um, and, and, and <coughs> a radically new world, the 
at least image, I mean, I'm not claiming this is historically true, but the image, and that's the important thing of Han Budi, is he's the one who took the great things that the first emperor did, <coughs> the creator of the great first empire, and he consolidated imperial rule by making an effective, efficient bureaucracy, an incredibly strong bureaucracy that was building massive public <coughs> infrastructure, claiming to be in support of the larger population by that means. The claim was, again, this is not historically accurate, but the claim was bringing back the Confucians, now being brought into the bureaucracy to, to attempt to create a harmonious society in which the Confucians brought into the bureaucracy through meritocratic means would therefore be guiding the development of a, of a harmonious world. And the claim is he is the one, Han Wuti is the one who then consolidates imperial rule in China, not only successfully saving the Han Dynasty, but even more importantly, successfully creating a new imperial era that the first emperor had tried to create and failed. So to return to the present moment, um, <laughs> One possible way of reading what Xi Jinping is up to here is he's kind of the Han Wudi to Mao's first emperor. And so Mao was the radical creator and the radical destructor and failed explicitly in terms of many of his own goals. And now the claim is, yet yeah, to really live up to Maoist ideals, the way to do it is not wipe out the corrupt party officials. The way to do it is, yeah, you get rid of the corrupt party officials, but you build an incredibly, claim to be, incredibly efficient meritocratic bureaucracy. What word do you use? Confucianism, <laughs> that you claim to be rebuilding. You claim to be building a Confucian society in which the party officials will be building a harmonious world. And so it's a kind of populism through efficient bureaucracy, which means, going back to your question, mm -hmm. um, he's kind of an ill-fitting figure when we compare him to the other authoritarian populist figures. I mean, Trump doesn't talk about building a good meritocratic effective bureaucracy. Putin certainly doesn't either. Um, Xi Jinping does. So, in part, I think he's playing Han Wu Di to Mao's first emperor. Can I? Can yes, I please. please. <laughs> but if you Should also, <laughs> <laughs> but if you also look at um, some of the very noticeable uh, things that Xi Jinping has done, he has led uh, a very ostens ostentatious crackdown oh, on yeah. civil society. Yes. Um, uh, lawyers, any. Uh, um, Absolutely. Uh, Sort of source of authority or ideas yes. in society that could oh. challenge the party Most structure. Definitely. Obviously, the, the neo Maoists are a slightly different matter here. Maybe we'll get onto those mm, later. Yeah. Um, uh, so there is a strongly punitive aspect Derek. to what he's doing with the disappearances. You know, ab absolutely yes. terrifying stuff. So would you not say then that that Xi Jinping is a legalist? Um, yes, <laughs> but of course the key way of putting it would be the first emperor was a legalist. And Han Wu Di is a legalist who builds in a successful legal system by claiming it to be Confucianism. And again, apart from historically what he really did, but at least the historical reading of him, which is the important thing in terms of his image, is he brings in Confucianism and he makes legalism work. So Han Wu Di is the figure who makes these incredibly powerful centralized structures aimed at building incredibly strong public infrastructure, aimed absolutely at wiping out dissension. And it's Han Wu Di who takes these, literally the same institutions, he rebuilds basically the same institutions as the Qin, but he makes them work. He legitimates them by bringing in the Confucians, claiming it to be Confucian, and successfully consolidates imperial rule. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, he's going back to Han Wu Di, he's a legalist in a Confucian vision that makes it work. And perhaps this is in part what Xi Jinping is trying to do. And then what would be the contradiction between the idea of a meritocracy and the way that Xi Jinping has clearly tried to clean out the ranks, particularly the leadership yeah. ranks, of people who are not Zijidoren, you know, it, are not his own people? It, so the claim, and this is obviously going to be one of the key things in terms of whether Xi Jinping is successful, the claim is that I, Xi Jinping, am not simply going after my political opponents, I'm simply going after corrupt officials, and the result will be a non-corrupt, a meritocratic form of governance that will then once again be building effective public infrastructure, a powerful education system, and creating a new modern China. Now, I think a lot of the success or failure of Xi Jinping will come down to that, as long as he is perceived to be simply using claims of corruption to wipe out 
his political opponents is the degree to which he will not be seen as, as living up to these claims, um, the degree to which, on the contrary, he can pull off a claim that, no, no, I really am, once again, building an effective bureaucracy um, is the degree to which he just might succeed. I mean, that, and we have to admit, there is a possibility he might. Mm. Yeah. Can I, now, I'm going to switch to, I think I'm going to leave this hanging, because clearly a lot of ideas will come from this in the Q&A, but I'm going to raise some slightly different subject, which is sort of how do we position ourselves as so-called imagined China experts, yes. sinologists, <laughs> and so on? Yes. And I raise that issue uh, partly because you both try to reach a much broader audience uh, in the path or in your translations. Um, when I was uh, uh, doing my PhD work, it was, it was drummed into me, you're writing for China historians, especially in China. That, and that as long as we were a small field, that worked. Uh, that was fine, and to be read by our Chinese colleagues and to converse with them, that was great. And Oh well, the history faculty will wake up at some point. Uh, but, not, but I think that situation has changed uh, because there's so much demand for China knowledge. Uh, but that also, what are our responsibilities? What are the dangers? Uh, what are the dangers of becoming associated with a China that is a version of China we may not want to be associated mm -hmm. with? How do you deal with these, these complexities in our own positioning as people in Chinese? I think, Michael, do you want to go sure. first? Sure. Let me just begin by saying I, I think you're absolutely right. It is now an international audience. It yeah. should be an international audience. China is a clearly rising power, and it is a topic of intense uh, concern, debate throughout the entire world, and it is now an international audience. And I think our responsibilities are, are numerous, but one key one I want to emphasize, referring back to the first question too, is we need to do everything we can to educate as many people as we possibly can about the complexities of what is going on. Um, just to stick with this example, I mean, when you get a claim of Xi Jinping saying, I'm bringing back Confucianism, um, immediately that will hit a lot of the stereotypes that Xi Jinping very happily would want us to have, that Confucianism is all about simply accepting authority and, and believing that we live in some kind of harmonious world that's being created by, by a powerful centralized state. Um, I would want an audience out there that would, on the contrary, see the complexities of that. That certainly a definition that Han Wudi would have happily agreed with as well. Um, there have been many other ways of reading these traditions. Even calling it an ism is, is quite a move in itself. And I would want an audience out there that could see the complexities of this. I would want an audience out there that could see the complexities of what is going on right now in terms of the state building enterprise. Um, we need to understand that there is at least an attempt to build a kind of alternate form of governance, and whether that's going to succeed or not, people need to understand what is going on, the implications of what is going on, and therefore the kinds of critiques that are being made need to be made of the complexities of what is in fact a, a very active, to put it mildly, debate going on in China itself. And I think part of our responsibility is to do everything we can to reach out beyond simply an immediate academic sphere mm -hmm. and try to get people a sense of the of the complexities of these terms, the cultural resonance of these terms, and the actual battle playing out, and who knows how it will play out over the next several decades, but it will have significant world historical implications, whatever happens, and I want a world out there that will be engaged and, and working through those debates and seeing their complexity. Um, I would speak out particularly as a practicing translator mm -hmm. for the value of translation. Yes. Um, translation also, in a way, as a form of, well, micro history, in yeah. fact. And yeah. of course, in uh, contemporary uh, Chinese history studies, I think that you know, the study of micro history, grassroots history, you know, history <laughs> using uh, grassroots archives, is some of the most interesting and exciting developments, you know, the so-called sort of garbology school of writing Chinese history, I sort of rummaging mm -hmm. through local government's uh, rubbish bins and finding the documents that they've, they've thrown out or have ended up in, in, in flea markets. But to, to, I suppose, to return to the subject of 
Uh, translation, I think translation, uh, and uh, we can use mm. the, your example of Confucianism, how do we understand yes. Confucianism, the great value, I think, of uh, literary translation, but I'll also talk about translation of non-fiction, but the great value of literary translation is it is, <coughs> you take a novel or a short story or an essay, another piece of literature, it's, it, it, is, it is a primary source there, because you, by translating this, you are presenting to a non-Chinese audience, you're making accessible to a non-Chinese audience, one individual's uh, response with, so encounter, response to or um, encounter with the society or a particular aspect of the, the society mm -hmm. of, of, their, of their time. So I mean, wish that academia, I think, recognised more translation because it doesn't get swept up into to, to rep and so on. But I think it's, it has, um, yes, it has a, a cultural and a literary import, but also a historical import also um, and you know a subject which is very much on the lips of um, Cambridge academics at the moment is the so-called decolonization of the curriculum I think one issue with that is it is still very hard for um, undergraduates to access for example uh, Sinophone historians work on China the historiography tends to be mainly Anglophone, mm. so you know, I would also put out a plea for you know more translations of non-fiction uh, uh, works out of China, um, because you know, despite the political constraints, there are excellent, excellent works, um, uh, and uh, I think well, CUP Cambridge University Press has done fantastic work with regard with regard to this, uh, but there's particularly with regard to the Cold War, which I work on, there are you know now a sort of generation in their prime of archival historians who are writing sort of cutting-edge material on, on Mao's China and the Cold War. Uh, so this is something really worth, really worth pushing for. You want to add and, to that? Uh, yes, um, a full agreement, and just to undermine the significance of this, uh, yes, I, I think much of the secondary literature out there, I'm sorry, <laughs> is, is, tends to be very one-sided, tends to give very limited portraits, and the degree to which we can successfully get more and more translated primary sources out there for people to wrestle with, the better. Mm -hmm. And let me simply add, as someone who works on, on a lot of the classical texts, so a lot of the classical political theory that is suddenly becoming hot again in China, the other thing we need are not just translations of the classical texts, we need translations of the utilizations and appropriations and reworkings and, and at every level, including most importantly right, right now, that the state level, not just interpretive studies, but actual translations that will give people a sense, not just here's a good translation of a Han Feitze, which is incredibly important, but also here is the way Han Feitze is being utilized and employed here and talked about here and debated here. And that, I think, will allow people an audience to really begin to get a sense of the complexities of what's going on right now. Not that everyone in the party, to say the least, has, has read all of this either, but I mean, they are actively wrestling with these ideas in ways that there is a deep history to, and the more we gain a sense of the kind of resonance of these terms, <laughs> the better we will be in a position to understand them, and I think translations are a key way to do that. Mm -hmm. Again, returning to Hans's question about how do we talk about China, I think yeah. most specialists thinking about China, whenever we hear that word, I think we always hear it in scare quotes in our head. You know, we, we, we write about China. Um, uh, obviously, it's, it's, it's impossible to generalise about this place. Um, uh, so vast and so complicated, so, 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 so diverse. Um, and I think what's uh, also uh, very, very fruitful in terms of academic discussions, which I think are now making their way into more popular discussions, is um, study of global China as well, so yes. global China's Chinese diasporas, um, yes. uh, the way that um, Different uh, versions of Chineseness have have have, have travelled through Southeast Asia and far beyond. Of course, uh, in my own field, um, uh, which is I'm currently working on global Maoisms. So much interesting work coming out on the ways that the theory and practice of Mao's ideas have travelled beyond China, which really confound the idea of a, a unified China, a unified Maoism, because it is just extraordinary the multiplicity of ways in which these ideas have been translated and also mistranslated throughout yes. the world. Yes. I don't sort of, I mean, it's, it's along this sort of decolonization theme, we can go, we can rejig our syllabi. I mean, that's sort of the easy step to do, I think. Um, but what, and I think you're beginning to hint at it yesterday, 
you're implying an institutional rearrangement of yes. universities. And um, in your university of the future, is there a department for China studies? Um, ideally, no. Right. Now, let me emphasize strongly, we're not there yet. So <laughs> if we get rid of China studies right now, it means no one will be learning about China <laughs> because in the, the so-called disciplines, China is not a part of it. So we desperately need it now. But in the future, yeah, let me think big for a moment. Um, what I would love is, it's is almost laughable as I say these words, but, but again, let's think big. I would love a future economics department, for example, where you're not just training students in rational choice theory and behavioral economics, the two bodies of, of theory out there. I would love if in an economics department, you would actually have people who, for example, learned East Asian languages, in our case, the China, languages of China, really worked with indigenous theories from indigenous economic theories in China, looked in depth at the complexities of economic practice and different forms of governmental inner workings with those forms of economic practice, and not and actually began rethinking economic theory to take this into account, and really thinking big, not simply to help us gain a under, better understanding of the economic history of China, although that's important, I would also like it to go to the next step where they could then begin questioning economic theory in general. And is it possible some of what we would find through that kind of work would allow us to rethink a lot of our assumptions, I would say often dangerous assumptions, about the global economy as it's working right now? And could bringing some of these theories into play allow us to really question a lot of the assumptions that are now literally guiding the policy-making decisions of the major powers of the world, in, in my opinion, in, in horrifying ways? That would be a great economics department. Um, could we imagine a future philosophy department? This one's more, more plausible um, to, to occur, but, but it's still going to be a lot of work, where you would get, for example, courses on ethical theory and political theory that would be inherently global. And you would just be teaching students not, here's Western theory, and we'll spend a week on the so-called non-Western stuff. It would just be political theory. And you would be learning about the complexities of political theory from a global perspective. Could we imagine all of the disciplines being rethought accordingly? Um, can you imagine future comparative literature departments that would live up to the name? And, and actually, students, even if they're not working in Chinese studies, would be learning the Chinese material, learning literary theories from China, and actively able to engage those. So all the disciplines from day one wouldn't be Western in terms of the material they're looking at, Western in terms of the theories they're looking at, with, again, at most a non-Western component, they would be rethought by, from a purely global, from a purely, I mean strongly, global perspective, most certainly including China. Now, that's a long way away, and this sort of work I'm talking about at this stage will only be done in a Chinese studies program. No economist would train or hire such a person. So we need Chinese studies now, but ideally, I would say, let's rethink the disciplines completely. That's it. Julia, this is sort of Michael becoming a Maoist and tearing up the yes. university, <laughs> having a cultural revolution, and, you can play and, the uh, my and finding nothing to save in these universities that grew out of wonderful German tradition and even transformed Cambridge into something useful. Um, are you in agreement with this? I think, think the thing to remember about Mao is, yes, he was a universalist, but he was also very much a nationalist. Oh, well, um, yeah. And so I'm not saying you're a nationalist, <laughs> um, but I do think we need to work out what is the place for nationalism in this schema. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the history of global institutions, they've always started with these beautiful idealistic blueprints, such as you know Goethe's World Literature, uh, moving right, on right. Through, through 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 the Nobel Prize, yeah. Olympic Games, but you know they've always. <sighs> founded on uh, the, 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 the nation-state division. So they've become, they've, yes. they've, they've, they've been sort of diverted and wrong-footed into oh, nationalism. So the Nobel Prize is a classic example of that absolutely. because when they name the writer, they always name the writer's nationality, um, yes. or either before, oh, yeah. or before the name or, 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 or straight after the name. Um, so I think, you know, if you have this wonderful globalized curriculum, you still need to ask who's going to decide it, who's going to adjudicate it. The fact is the Nobel Prize has these aspirations to be this universalist arbiter of literary taste, mm. but it's decided by 12 individuals, mainly men, I think, still in yeah, Sweden. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, so, so the, obviously that poses questions about yeah. objectivity and, and, yes. and uh, universalization and, and so on and so forth. 
Um, the other uh, issue that I would um, uh, like to raise with regard to this is I can't speak to the American context, mm. but in the UK, uh, this is a country where the study of modern languages is always under threat. You know, it seems to be constantly a threatened subject area, um, and particularly in a world, again, where all languages are not equal. Um, you know, for many years, obviously, China was angry about not having won a Nobel Prize in literature and whenever. Very often, when there were broadsheet discussions of this, for example, outside China, they would say, well, the thing about Chinese is it's a small language. Um, uh, it's still, uh, it's still talk, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, or, or it's a language sort of on the margins of yep. world literature, which is you know, a completely... <laughs> extraordinary thing to say but the perspective is sort of small I suppose within the global economics of world publishing which of course is still dominated by the mm. institutions mm. the review Absolutely. organs and the publishing of the culturally, culturally dominant anglophone world which of course takes in every year publishes far more translated work sorry far fewer translated mm -hmm. works proportionally than say Holland, the, the mm. Netherlands, China, so on and so forth, so forth, or even 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 France and Spain. Um, so uh, you know, I can, I mean, Hans obviously teaches in a Chinese department uh, here in Cambridge. Mm. I'd be interested to know his answer to this question: that um, does he feel sufficiently confident about the place of the study of modern languages, particularly a modern language like Chinese, which is culturally, historically, linguistically remote? from uh, uh, European languages, would you feel sufficiently confident in the status of those languages to do away with a department that specialises in, in, in study of these languages? Yeah, you're going to put me on the spot. Exactly, <laughs> that was exactly my intention. Um, yes, I mean, there's sort of the great fear of Chinese going the same way as Dutch. It's going to be removed from the curriculum. Um, and I think the questions, you, the pragmatic questions are all too real. And it was only last week at a high table when I told one somebody, uh, some rich alumni, what, what I was doing. And I said, well, I'm, I, I, I study Chinese history. And I said, I, the, the, the question was, is that all? And I'm like, what? <laughs> 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 I mean, really insane. Um, and I think, and maybe I think there is a difference here in what I understand the US situation to be. Where I know Michael's courses are the largest ones uh, at Harvard, which is great. You get these huge audiences. Uh, and here, uh, because we're in a China Studies Department, we are not. We are audiences very limited. And so on one hand, and we do know that lots of people in the history faculty, we know that nobody learns about China because we're hived off in a very marginal department. So I think there are moves to be made mm. there. Uh, and you, some might argue that the split between MML and FAMES is a very artificial one. But, so how you would reorganize, I mean, I think I would agree that ultimately you would want to come to sort of more global, not just China, but the Middle East, South America, Absolutely. the rest of Europe, Eastern Europe, Russia, all that needs to be part of things. How you're going to get there is going to be very difficult, and I think all the risks you outline are there, and we need to be very careful before our idealism lets oh, sweep absolutely. away. And particularly when you, get, oh, yes. when you get students being, who are, I, I know students um, uh, just started Chinese and their friends and family would say, why do you want to study a modern language? I mean, there's Google Translate. True. Uh, <laughs> no more to say. I just convinced my local school that they should study world languages. And so they all, all 11, 12 year olds are learning Chinese and it will do so through the rest of their secondary education. Chinese and Spanish. I think it's a great thing. And yet these little village kids running around with characters, it was just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So there's a change. The <laughs> last question, oh, okay. so the last question, yeah, I just want to let me throw it open, yes. uh, is one, is a request for advice, if I can put it that way. It is about censorship, and of course Cambridge, uh, CUP uh, has been, has had its problems that we all no doubt know about. And this relates back to Xi Jinping. There is clearly a move of Beijing under Xi Jinping trying to exert influence outside its borders. It's, it's, it's almost painful to watch how this is playing out in Hong Kong, but we are not free from that. And it raises all kinds of issues about what we do as universities, what should be 
what should be what, what kinds of things we are afraid of. Uh, the PRC embassies have influence through their student networks. Uh, what should university presses do? What should we do? Should we accept invitations to go to Beijing and uh, uh, analyze, uh, on the basis of our great knowledge and all that, uh, the great contributions of Xi Jinping to Marxism in the 21st century uh, invitations that are now going around in various places? So. I think there are lots of issues here. Mm. Um, so Julia, you want to pick up on this? Yeah, um, and you know, I need a full disclosure here on this issue of censorship. So um, one of my books has been translated into Chinese in, on the mainland and in Taiwan. Um, my book on the opium war and mm. looking at the afterlives of the yes. opium war. Um, and in the process of translating it, so it, it, it looks both at the opium war, but it looks at the historiography of the opium war. So it takes the story through to the present day, um, through to the Mao era and uh, the post-Mao era. Um, and in the process of it being translated, I was told that the uh, parts on the Mao era would have to get anything from from any part of the book which was written, which which involved Mao and post Mao China, uh, had to had to go. Um, uh, it was a very serious publisher. It's an excellent translator. Mm. So it's a huge respect for the people that I worked with. I decided to go ahead with the publication because I felt that um, although the points I was making about the politicization of historiography were most explicitly made in a certain part of the book, in the, 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 the post mail part of the book, um, I felt that the points were that I was engaging with were already quite strongly implicitly there in the part of the book. The, the book which was going to be translated was already quite challenging of um, received historical wisdom on these key events in modern history. So I decided to go ahead with it because my impulse is always to engage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously to try to keep that engagement uh, on, on one's own terms. Um, so I've been lucky to speak to journalists about my work and also to go to China to talk to the book and engage in to and fro with audiences. It's not ideal to have parts of the book missing, but I felt that the spirit of the book was there and it has brought great benefits in enabling me to uh, engage about this historiography with uh, Chinese audiences. On the other hand, um, one of my articles was on the list of CUP censored articles in in fact, um, uh, an article about the international legacies of the Cultural Revolution, which is something of a red button issue in contemporary China. Um, I was extremely glad I'd signed the petition protesting um, mm. CUP's decision to censor those articles, and I was extremely glad that it backtracked on it for two reasons. Okay, um, I felt it was a somewhat different sort of censorship from the censorship which I had to. Uh, um, uh, adhere to with regard to my book because in China they were censoring the original English language version mm -hmm. so it would be the equivalent of my English language book going out to China and some poor soul having to rip out the chapter on post mail so that's really quite an Orwellian thing that the, these these things just do not, so, so telling Chinese audiences these things do not exist either in the English language or the Chinese language they have never existed. Um, and I think the other message, the dangerous message that it would have sent if CUP had stuck by that original decision was that an institution with the uh, intellectual and cultural clout of the University of Cambridge, which is a huge global brand, um, uh, it would have sent the message that uh, Cambridge University um, was on bended knee to this, to this system. So again, sort of to return to um, uh, Michael's very laudable utopian plans, you know, I would like to see a united front uh, between publishers, um, you know, Springer mm, and so absolutely. on, and, 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 and other publishers, um, to have a, 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 a unified stance on this. Yes, um, I very much agree with that. And, and let me then go back to the, your first point, with which I, I'm also in strong agreement, unless there seemed to be a contradiction between those two. Let me just underline the point. Um, it's for we as individual scholars, I think the goal needs to be engagement. And engagement is a very complex activity. 
And keep in mind, easy answers to questions like this mm -hmm. can make the work in the long run much more difficult for everyone. And so, yes, I think what engagement means is at the institutional level, usually that's going to mean a very strong stance, unacceptable to give into any form of censorship. For we as individuals, um, I think the way you handled it was, was beautifully done. I mean, for we as individuals, um, what I strongly recommend, and you're asking for advice, I would say to many of us who will be facing this, um, work with colleagues in China um, who are actively working with us. China is a very complicated world right now. It's always a complicated world, but on this issue, it's a very complicated world. And you have all sorts of strategies for who your audiences are, how you work with them, how you signal to things, to, to by the ways you write things. And when it comes down to, can this paragraph be taken out? Um, I agree, it's too easy to simply say, under no circumstances. Sometimes the better answer is the one you gave to say, yes, as long as I'm sure elsewhere, I'm saying things that will make it clear to a readership the, <laughs> the key points. And you're writing for readership that sadly is very aware of censorship and is actively dealing with this on a daily basis. And they know how to read between the lines. They know how to work with this. So as individual scholars, I think, engage. An easy answer that means no engagement is not wise and makes things very difficult. At an institutional level, I agree. And there you make the much more principled stand. As an institution, you say, unacceptable. And again, with we as individuals, it's really messy. And I would say, work with colleagues and, 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 and learn from them as to what they are recommending, how they are negotiating. And here, I think we have much to learn from people who sadly are forced to deal with this on a daily basis. And absolutely the last point I would make is that there is a huge appetite and curiosity Incredible. within China for Intense. multilingual takes Intense. on many, many issues to do with, with China. Um, obviously not just in Western languages, but including in Western languages. Um, so you know, th this is this huge interest and um, passion Intense. for critical reading, for you know, corroborating and sort of comparing at least two accounts of the same events. Uh, whenever I've been in China, I'm always asked questions about, about Jonathan Spence, about um, James Hevia, sort of Frederick mm. Wakeman, you know, the yes. greats of modern Chinese history. There's this fascination with what uh, uh, Western historians have said about China, as well as their own homegrown yes. historians. We're going to throw it open uh, at this point, but I think just, just sort of one warning. Uh, so I, I think we should also recognize that China is extremely good at censorship. Yeah, and they mold uh, ideas within that society very, very effectively. Um, we need to be very cautious. Please. Okay, what I'm going to do, can I, take, can I take three questions at a time so we can work in a lot of people? Sure. No, I want to go back to the second exchange that I made, yeah. which was conducted very much in terms of philosophy and history and economics, uh, and wasn't perhaps sufficiently problematizing those terms. Yes. I personally am all in favor of being ecumenical about how we construe what philosophy consists in, or economics, and whether economics is appropriate as a category when we're analyzing other cultures. And similarly with history, and even with mathematics, which is a, 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 one of the most difficult cases. I think that it's important not to underestimate the resistance that Michael's marvelously idealistic program is going to be faced when professors will have to redefine their own subjects in order to accommodate these uh, other, other traditions that are so important for our proper understanding. That's not a question, it's a comment. Okay. <laughs> so, one, two. Yes, please. Uh, I was also wondering, uh, as historians, uh, you tend to speak a lot about the emperors who built the empires and not the subjects, people who are from down below. And connecting into the topic of yesterday and neoliberalism, uh, neoliberalism uh, creates multiple channels. It's not just state and subject. Now you have governance, you know, a whole machinery. Yes. How does that fit in with the China of today? Yes. Are there similar questions like this? Yes, please. Um, you touched on um, how Xi Jinping is using Confucianism nowadays. I'm wondering how he cherry picks some virtues to emphasize but not from others, and how your population Liberalism, Confucianism, is there anybody else who 
Great series like, of rich questions. So, Julia, first. I, 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 what was the name of the lady who just asked the question? Abhita. Abhita. Yeah, I suppose I would um, go. I, is it Chakrabarti and provincialising Europe who mm. come? I'm paraphrasing him here, I think, but he complains that um, it's always, for example, historians of South Asia who are trying to have conversations with their Precisely. European counterparts. So, they have to be aware of what yeah. their European counterparts are doing, exactly. whereas their European counterparts can absolutely ignore what is going on mm -hmm. outside uh, Europe. So exactly. I, think, I think you're right, we're still dealing with a sort of fundamental imbalance in how sort of knowledge is valued and considered important. And you know, I think I noticed in other uh, de history departments in the UK that sort of so-called global historians are very, very willing to have conversations with their Europeanist or their British history uh, colleagues, but you don't necessarily get that sense of willingness always coming in the opposite direction. So, you know, absolutely, that is something that I have noticed. Um, I suppose the, the the question about history from the grassroots, I'll say um, a few things about that. Again, I suppose that comes back to my point about translation. Um, that you know, translation is an excellent way to engage with. You know, one individual's take on something because literature is such an intensely individualistic enterprise. It's one individual's response to something. Um, but you know, you, you know, a, 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 absolutely, uh, it's something that we need to be attentive to if we're going to make sense of China's present and future. Something we didn't talk about with regard to mm. Xi Jinping is, of course, absolutely. what's going on in local government. So yeah. you hear a lot about how he's exerting control at the top. But a huge challenge for China's economy is the large number of sort of bad loans, so sort of non-performing non loans. Um, and an issue there is you know, local governments feeling that they can, they, they can take out these loans, they don't need to declare them, there's this sense that they have this, this, this leeway, this latitude. And that is a huge challenge for Xi Jinping. Can he can he, can, he, can he rein them in? Because um, you know, we, we have a, otherwise we're going to have a very, very hazy understanding of what is actually going on in the Chinese economy because there are so many bad loans we don't, we don't know about. So, so Michael, can I ask yes. you, sort of, sort of some, some questions are being asked about your utopia, <laughs> about its nature, mm -hmm. about potentially its elitism, mm -hmm. uh, and about sort of the roadmap towards it. Yes. So go for it. Absolutely. So <laughs> let me let me immediately say um, again. I'm not saying get rid of Chinese studies departments tomorrow. Of course, absolutely. That would be insane. That would mean literally all knowledge would be Western. It would be wiping everything out. What I am saying, however, is actually a much stronger argument. I think, which is to say, at the moment, what we have finally accomplished after you know, decades of pushing, and it's good we've accomplished this, but but. Instead of resting on our laurels, we should realize this is a very dangerous moment. What we've accomplished is the equivalent of non-Western requirements. So when I was being educated, China, for example, was not part of the curriculum. I literally did not learn about China. It was never mentioned in any of the schools I was, grew up in in America. Now, fortunately, that's changed. And now we actually have a legally required non-Western requirement in K through 12, the equivalents in most colleges in the US. And so every student has to learn about the non-West. Now, I, 
I'm guessing in some ways that's better <laughs> than, than the world I grew up in. Um, the reason I use the word I guess is I'm not terribly sure it is. I mean, if you look at the textbooks in America about what they say about the non-West, I mean, clearly what students are de facto being taught is that everything that matters is the West. It's what matters in terms of the history of the world. It's what matters in terms of the rise of modernity. It's what matters in terms of all of the conceptual categories that we're using. And then you get your chapter or the equivalent of a class or two weeks of a class in which you get the non-West, which is sort of everything else. And I mean, frankly, it, it kind of reads like Hegel. I mean, we haven't gone anywhere in two centuries. And, and by having the equivalent of a non-West, we have a Chinese studies department where people can, can <laughs> specialize a little bit more, those of you who want to do it. But this is an incredibly dangerous world we're living in if this is how we're educating our students. Um, what I want is, in, yes, it's utopian. And to get to Sir Jeffrey's point, too, I mean, we're talking generations of work to get to this. It took generations to even get our non-Western requirement, um, <laughs> what minimal victory that is. And we're talking generations still. There will be incredible resistance. But you aim at the younger generations as they're coming up. And if we can start hitting the younger generations and getting them to start thinking critically about the concepts that they are simply being taught in the schools and getting them to question it, if we can get them to start, yes, learning languages outside of the so-called West, if we can get them to start thinking critically about such things as the so-called rise of the modern world, <laughs> um, if we can get them to immediately, if they even hear someone talk about, oh, let's discuss the rise of the novel, imagine a student would immediately say, whoa, but actually it arises at the same time in China. And most students don't know that. Suppose they do. And suppose we hit them with this, this knowledge, this empirical understanding, and yes, an ability to begin questioning a lot of the concepts they're being given, you know, modernity being an obvious one, but there are a ton of others. And they then are the ones who begin rethinking the world around them, and they start rethinking the disciplines. And eventually, they move up in positions of power. <laughs> and that's true in the academic world, but of course, the much bigger battle isn't even the academic world. It's the educational sphere in general, and hopefully reaching far beyond that. Is this utopian? Absolutely. But if it took us three decades to get the non-Western requirement, let's spend the next <laughs> three decades going this next step. And that could be an extraordinary step. And we will be educating an entire generation of students that would be, from day one, not having a perfect understanding of the world, but from day one would have a critical view of all of the knowledge they were being taught from what is otherwise a, an incredibly, I wouldn't even call it Western-centric, um, view of the world. It's a piece of the West that's part of this modernity narrative that involves claims of what a religion is, what a novel is. This is what I want to question. And I think that's doable. It's a ton of work, but I don't think it's utopian in the sense that it's undoable. It just is a ton of work that makes it Three people who want to comment. So first, Rule, then Sakadin, and then Simon. Rule. Thank you very much. I, I share Michael's kind of utopian view of the world, but I also share Julius caution there yeah. about you know the, the, yeah. the kind of need you know for expertise yeah. the way i see it now is i mean i mean this very event is part of course of a trend across campuses yeah. in the world china is becoming you know it's becoming it's becoming big you know and in the yeah. publishing industry it's becoming big you know there are many china watchers Absolutely. and you know they're sort of a they're they're, they're a profession that, that self multiplies and increasingly we have people from all walks of life you know, write and publish on China mm. and from documentaries on China. <clears throat> and that's that's wonderful. But that also, you know, represents a danger that in this yeah. particular critical space, yes. some of the tools, some of the translations, mm. some of the okay. interpretations of some very fundamental sort of uh, products of Chinese thinking and yeah. Chinese thought uh, are not are not available yet or basically they're not on curricula yet. Yes. And so there is a danger that we you know, that we that, that we end up discussing Confucianism as if the Confucianism by Xi Jinping is the same as the Confucianism of the historical Confucius. Exactly. And you know that we find it strange that, that as the debate says the Chinese authorities select pick selectively from Confucius, yeah. which is something that's been done for over two thousand five hundred years. Also it's yes. just to get that conversation within perspective. Uh, is absolutely essential to keep investing in teaching research in our universities, mm -hmm. you know, in these disciplines, 
in the set. I mean, it's inconceivable to find today uh, <clears throat> a classicist who will tell you that democracy as it appears in Athens is the same as democracy as we experienced it in whatever North America and Europe. Yet, confusionism is, is one big sort of um, ideology that is timeless and spaceless. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Jacqueline. to yeah. this, which is, um, a, this comes out of a discussion I'd have with my MPhil students this afternoon, that is the issue of in what modes, and sort of relating to your translation, what are the media we choose to work on, yes. and how might that change? Yes. Uh, we are so obsessed about the monograph, partly because of the US yeah. tenure yeah. system, uh, <laughs> it's true, yeah. it's true. true. And, and, and publishing yes. houses depend on this, and as, I think as Will was indicating, yeah. We're losing our younger audiences Absolutely. as a result because they Absolutely. don't read monographs. <laughs> they look, <laughs> listen to podcasts and they do. Yes. Yeah. So I think that makes it even more complicated. So off you go. Yes, <laughs> good, good. <laughs> so to begin with the, the first two questions, um, I, I agree. I think this is one of the dangers of where we currently are with the so-called non-Western requirement. What it does is it completely essentializes a China, or even worse, a non-West. And, and it, we even essentialize in such terms as Confucianism, because if you look at these horrific textbooks that our poor students are being taught, um, I mean, what can you say if you get five pages to talk about the non-West? And what you get are the equivalents of Confucianism is about people following authority. Taoism is about following nature and, and, and being happy. I mean, just ludicrously wrong things, but you know, what else can you say? And this is all Chinese ways of thinking. Um, and that's what we're teaching. So, returning to my grand utopian vision, um, what I would say is one of the many things we would attain is, isn't even, and I, I, I loved your way of putting it, putting China in quotation marks, Eventually, what I would love is these terms would be used when it's helpful to talk about self-conceptions, which emerges at a certain time, of what China is. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we wouldn't be even needing these terms. Um, Confucianism is, is a nonsensical term until you get to the modern period. There's no such thing as Confucianism. Right. It's made into an ism in the modern period. And therefore, I want students who know what that immediately. If they hear the word Confucianism, they know it's got nothing to do with <laughs> earlier readings of, of this person called Confucius. Um, it's a completely modern construction. Um, I want people, when they hear the word religion, to know that's a modern concept defined in a certain way to build a, a self-defined secular society. And things that we like to categorize under ritual, under religion, like you know, ritual practices, etc., 
that's pushed outside of the notion of religion. And if you look at actually what most humans have done when they did things like ritual, which was inherently part of, and returning back to Sir Jeffrey's question too, economic activity as well, political practices, it, it doesn't work when we're even using our categories of religion, economy, politics. I mean, all of these are modern terms that are self-defined to create a claim about what a modern world is normatively, or should be, I should say. And again, I want a generation of students that would push against all of this. And yes, moving perfectly then to Simon's <laughs> question, which I think cuts to the heart of it, um, this is a golden moment in China. So just with the example I touched on briefly, in China, you're getting religious studies programs being built. Mm -hmm. And horrifyingly, from my perspective, many of them are actually being based on the Western model of religion. And so you get specialists in the different religions of the different nation states. <laughs> Whereas on the contrary, what they need to be doing, and what I'm happy to say people are now beginning to do, is to say, no, we're going to use this opportunity when we're actually, being, we're actually creating departments kind of out of scratch because we're getting this ton of money, and we're going to completely rethink the field. <laughs> and we're going to drop these categories, and we're going to train generations of students to see behind the dangerous claims of what a so-called religion is that defines a so-called nation state of so-called Chinese people, and, and really actually from day one is training students to rethink all of that. And that would lead, yes, to a complete rethinking of all the other disciplines too, the more the better. And again, we're not going to do it immediately, but you could begin right there and then you're training a generation of students to start doing this, and lo and behold, things begin to change. Mm -hmm. Julian. Just to take up Simon's point with regards to what curricula might look like in China, I would just like to remind uh, or to, to recall um, that for decades, um, and you can take this all the way back to the early 20th century, Chinese thinkers and intellectuals have been extremely aware of a very large cultural deficit between China and the West that so much more gets translated and talked about from Western writers and thinkers arriving in China than travels in the opposite direction. You know, this became almost an issue of, of, of state policy in the 1980s when you know, discussions about why China didn't have a no, you know, Nobel Prize winners in, in, in literature and science and economics. It says, you know, what, what, why, is China, why are we taking in so many um, ideas and thinkers from outside China and why is the, the traffic not traveling uh, in the opposite direction. Um, so I think you know, we, in some ways that the that, that curricula in China are, yes, yes, they're, they're problematic and they're huge lacunae, but in some respects, perhaps in terms of cosmopolitanizing the curriculum, they are ahead of us, in fact. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, absolutely. Uh, and the other point I would make would be you know, about teleologies and how things move forward. You know, I absolutely love Michael's optimism and can-do spirit, and he's sort of talking about, you know, it took us this number of generations to get to non-Western civ as in, in, in the curriculum. So hopefully we can push it forward in the next few generations. But I think actually that things don't work teleologically oh, and in of terms of, of progress. And I was a classic example of this, I think, is how technology is working and how the internet is working. That example I gave about Google Translate, uh, you would hope that the internet would break down boundaries and make people feel that, you know, they, that it's easier to travel to places and speak other language and have Skype conversations and all that, all those sorts of things in other languages. But actually, sometimes, quite often, I think it's having an opposite mm -hmm. effect that people are thinking, "Come, oh, we got Google Translate. Why on earth would you want to learn Chinese?" Um, you, mm -hmm. To which you immediately say, "Amazing enough, when you have conversations with people, Google Translate is not on the kind of auto cue in front of you." Um, uh, and uh, I was going to say one other thing, but it's but it's but it's okay. Um, there's only other but forms of scholarship, and those forms of Chinese scholarship that are coming back, which is also yes. very interesting uh, yes. and needs to be part of what we do. Yes. And also needs to be institutionally recognized by our Absolutely. assessment procedures. We haven't heard much from students. So I want to see student hands go up. Your student. 
Uh, <laughs> I know, I know those cheats. <laughs> so, quite a few. So let's let's take three. There's one there, one there, and you have. I thought you would have a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Away from this discussion of distance, I'm not studying China as scholarly. Yes. But um, yes. what I was wondering is uh, about the question of, um, of foreign policy and the debate about the design of Xi and the uh, uh, the, um, uh, the whole debate about his uh, resigning of leadership. Uh, because there has been, uh, and what you were saying about this reflex against China, there's this, if China is national media, you're afraid of it. There was talk of China being more aggressive on the international sphere, more um, expansionist, um, more up and going, and sort of seen as a threat to the West. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, there was also the, the, the was BRICS summit just before the Communist Party conference, and there was a question where you said in the debate was just about uh, giving Xi the, the sort of national understanding and, and to, to back his leadership. So I was wondering whether. Um, this whole debate of uh, interventionism, of uh, maybe also the civil war, etc. Uh, in your opinion, we should read this through a sort of, um, whole domestic politics lens, or really it's sort of new Chinese foreign policy? Okay, so it's. Of course, you said yes, please. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm both very interested in the question of censorship and censorship in general. And I wanted to ask a practical question to Julia. How, how did the publisher justify to you the need to get rid of part of your book? And on a broader level, is there some sort of official narrative or conceptualization about the need for censorship uh, on one hand? And how do Chinese scholars and intellectuals conceptualize and discuss this problem? Great question. Um, I don't know if this is a question, but um, like, again, I like Professor Pugh's idea of teaching another non-Western culture in the university. Um, but I'm also thinking of the, the, the limits of just teaching such curriculum in, in, in a classroom, because I mean, um, whatever we're, we're teaching people is sort of a presentation. So we are presenting what we thought as China or as, what, uh, as Japan to, to a group of students. And actually, um, that, that's just my experience. when I. Because I, I personally, I, uh, from childhood, I, 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 I'm a big fan of Japanese popular culture. But I went to a, a, a Japanese culture class in a university. And the fir in the first class, my teacher told, what she told us is, is that, and she's Japanese, by the way, mm. and she said there's no such thing as Japanese culture. So she just deconstructed <laughs> the idea from day one. And, but in the end, it makes so much sense that because she's normalizing this whatever China or Japan right. means to people. Precisely. And in the end, I think it's also important to urge people to go to that place, live in the place, and experience it, and have some kind of phenomenological experience of what does this different culture mean to them. So I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. Um, Julia, you want to go first yes, I will do foreign policy and censorship. Shall I do that? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, you're you're absolutely right. Obviously, foreign <coughs> policy um, almost always, I think, tells us as much about, if not more, about domestic policy than it does actually about foreign policy. And, and China is is very definitely no exception um, with regard to that rule. Um, with with regard to where foreign policy is going under Xi. Um, I have perhaps noticed something of a step change um, with the promotion of Wang Huning, the new um, propaganda czar, uh, who at least as it's being uh, highlighted in the media is presenting the so-called China dream or you know Xi Jinping thought Xi's model as a a model to be emulated by other developing societies. So he's presenting this model as a kind of Chinese wisdom. It's not entirely new. I think that was always implicitly there in Xi Jinping's definition of, of, of a China dream, which was his sort of flagship soft power outreach policy, which he began to roll out late 2012, early 2013. So it was always there. I think it. I think it probably is significant that it does seem to be coming out more to the fore now. Although obviously I 
defer to um, foreign policy watchers on this. Um, uh, but of course, it's nothing new. You saw that very, very strongly under Mao, with you know Mao era China's aspirations to take on leadership of the world revolution in the 1960s. It takes obviously a backseat under Deng, with sort of Deng's rhetoric about you know China should never be a hegemon, and you know, for, also for pragmatic reasons, um, Deng focuses his own efforts back on sort of domestic economic reconstruction, you know, really reigns in these crazily large aid budgets to places like Africa, other places in the developing world. Um, but of course, you know, we still need to remember that I, I think sort of Deng Xiaoping's China is putting a lot of money into the Khmer Rouge through the, through, through the 1980s. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it, it, it's shaded. It's, it's, um, there, there are no no, no, no absolutes. Um, but I do think that, yeah, I, I, I do smell a bit of a step change, but we'll have to watch and see, see what, 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 what emerges. Thank you for your question about censorship. It was presented to me as in terms of if these chapters don't go, the whole book can't be published. So it's, it's, um, if, if you take those, it, 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 it was a zero sum game. Um, so if these two chapters about Mao and post-Mao China stay, you have no chance of um, uh, engaging with uh, Chinese audiences at all. So my previous book, had, that had been a complete no-no because I talked about Gao Xinjian and the Nobel Prize, which had become, again, sort of red-button political issue after the first ethnically Chinese writer did win a Nobel Prize in 2000, uh, but he was a, an exile, a Chinese exile writer in France. So that had made that a, a no-go for the Chinese for, the, for, for, for Chinese readers. So that's how it was. Um, so that made that, that that earlier book a complete no-go. But it was it was uh, it was it, that's how it was set out to me with the with the most recent book. Um, and again, I decided sort of also through conversations with other. Chinese readers who'd read it in English that you know, we decided that we felt important parts of the narrative were already coming through in earlier parts of the book. You know, the introduction also set out the ideas and the introduction went through. Um, so that was how I made that decision. In terms of the rules, that is such a fantastic question and the, I still, I feel the best way to visualize it is um, the, uh, the, 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 the image used by a wonderful scholar of modern Chinese literature, literature called Perry Link, mm -hmm. who wrote a famous essay in the New York Review of Books, oh, 10 or 15 years ago, and he called Chinese censorship the anaconda in the chandelier. Um, so, and what he meant by that is this, this kind of sleeping snake, I guess, um, and that there are, you know, the, the genius of the Chinese censorship system mm -hmm. is that there are very, very few clear red lines um, and as a result, uh, publishers and writers tend to self-censor because they're worried about these. They're worried about these red lines. Um, if some, they're worried about these these invisible red lines. Um, if one is crossed, obviously there are ways and means of making this very very clear to publishers writers and, and so on, but the genius of it, I think, the, the evil genius of it, um, is the uncertainty around it. And I think it's very, very troubling if you start to see Western publishers also try to second guess this system. So there's um, a huge furore kicking off in Australia at the moment mm -hmm. because a, an uh, Australian academic who works in education uh, has written a book to be published by Alan and Unwin. It was under contract uh, and he was criticizing the role of the Chinese government within Australian educational establishments. Yeah, you can Google this, there's a lot of stories about it. Um, and in order to um, uh, avoid uh, any threat of litigation, the publisher, Alan and Unwin, just decided to break the contract to, to, pull, to pull the book. And this has been a huge issue in uh, debate about Chinese studies and the relationship between the Chinese government and Western, acad uh, Western academia. So this is another part, I suppose, offshoot of the invisible red line phenomenon. Do you want to say something about Chinese? Oh, absolutely. Um, beautifully put. And 
I agree. I actually think this is one of the dangers of the current moment we're in, because it's part and parcel of the non-Western requirement piece, too, that when students get that moment when they're given their stuff about China, as you said, there has to be a representative there to explain China to them. And it assumes a world where there's a China that is going to be explained by a representative, and it's usually going to be one because it's only that, that <laughs> moment in a curriculum where they get it. And it creates a certain vision of what Chinese studies is, where you have to be the representative of your topic X for your body of students. Until we move past this, again, we're going to be stuck in the world of, of China identity -ness, which is a horrible place to be. It's something we can study. It's the last thing we want to be in practice claiming to represent. <laughs> Ultimately, it's another reason why we need to break down the entire way we are thinking about these, these topics. So you don't have the equivalent of the non-Western requirement, the one moment when you learn about China from a representative. Rather, you're thinking globally, and you're training students to think globally. And to go back to your example, which is such a beautiful one, you're training students to immediately question when they hear a claim about China is X. We, we want a generation of students who immediately see why is this person making this claim? What is the power of this position, person to make this claim? And immediately see it is simply nothing but a claim, and therefore something they should be deeply suspicious of. Thank you. I think I've sort of time for one last round of questions. There's one there, another one there, and uh, Bill in the middle. So please, let's go from my left to your left. Um, I'm from Singapore, so I, I represent the Chinese diaspora, and I think for my generation especially, because especially for Singapore, where we have moved past and beyond a certain stage of development, and where my generation especially, we start thinking about how we see ourselves as China. And it is especially quite quite a new thing, especially with the rise of China. But the problem for many Singaporean Chinese, I feel, is that we don't see one Chinese face. And there isn't there isn't Mandarin only. We see Cantonese, we see Teochew, Hokkien, Hokju, all these dialects. And I feel that the academia that we face now is that it it paints China as a very single yes. one, a single-sided view. But from a personal point of view, I see that China is quite diverse and there's a lot of difference. I, you learn a lot of things just from the language alone, the spoken language alone. And do you feel that there is a missing out, a loss in this, that mm. people mm. fail to understand Cantonese opera, or even in the contemporary era, like Canto Pop, it, it doesn't rhyme, it doesn't, it does, there's no rhythm or rhyme yeah. if you translate it. Yeah. Is there, is there a fear of this loss? especially when it comes to the future where China studies becomes a study of just China. But, this, but China is not, it's not China. Yeah. Very, very, very sharp yes. question. Yeah. Uh, yes. Tonight we've been talking about the role of uh, China studies or sinology in education. Mm -hmm. uh, being in academia, that, that, that's a suitable topic. Uh, and earlier Professor Van Den had mentioned there's a strong emphasis on monographs. But it appears in our popular culture today that monographs aren't as valued as before. Uh, what, are, what is the role of the China scholar in more popular forms of education uh, in terms of television, film, internet uh, units of, or curricula? And, and what, 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 what do you think we can do? Because you can only reach so many students in a classroom. Very interesting sets of questions. I was yes. Do you know if the people who read your book in China would uh, they know it's been censored? Like, will they know there's things missing and do they have an idea how much of it is missing? And then what, uh, in, in the same vein, uh, whether because you said that um, the, so much things are translated into Chinese, whether there is a risk because, and, and so, so little art is translated to outside of China, from China, that there, there may be the case that since the, 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 it could be a sort of vacuum of ideas. Translation. I knew people like Julia who are very good translators. 
So we get good translations from Chinese into English, but the other way around, there's an awful amount of very bad translations into Chinese. Um, that creates its own real problems, um, and that's a big danger, I think, too. Yes. But Michael, can I, can I ask Please. just some of these yeah. questions and respond to that? Yes, um, and let me begin with your wonderful question. I agree completely. And I'll preface it by saying, again, it's good we created Chinese studies, it's good we got the non-Western requirement, it's good we finally have professorships in Chinese studies. Um, so I'll preface that because it's going to sound like I'm critiquing that. No, I think that's a good thing that we, we have that. Um, again, I grew up in a world where there's China was never mentioned, and I'm glad it's now mentioned. But I think your example is a perfect one. Despite this progress, and I, I'm happy to call it progress at a certain level, this is what we've created, where, again, it goes back to the question two, where basically China becomes, by definition, defined as a thing, even though every China expert will tell you, of course it's not, of course it's not. But the way it's presented to students, it kind of is. <laughs> and every, every discussion of China kind of represents China as a de facto homogeneous thing, even when almost every statement by any professor is going to be, of course, it's not homogeneous, but, and then they get the you know, bam. So yes, I, I think this is one of the key things we need to move beyond. I mean, just to stick to your example, and it's a beautiful one, and we are not even educating students in the fact that it's through these extraordinary trade works, trade networks through which the entire diaspora developed that much of what we, I think, falsely call the modern world actually is developing through these extraordinary trade networks that spread across all of Eurasia. This isn't even known, and why in that particular example isn't it known? Because it doesn't fit our vision of China, which is always going to be looking at what were the states doing in the North China Plain? Right. A very important question, but it should be posed as what are states doing in the North China Plain, <laughs> which is not China, it's what states are trying to do in the North China Plain. Very important question. And meanwhile, you've got the Chinese diaspora that the state couldn't control, and oftentimes kind of just ignored because they couldn't control, which is why it doesn't even appear in the historical records. So if we are really breaking down our categories, yeah, China's one of the first ones to go. And we kind of need it as long as we have the equivalent of a non-Western requirement, as long as we have China studies. But in a world where we wouldn't be reliant on a non-Western requirement or China studies, then we would no longer be required to be de facto presenting a unified China, even though we always claim we're not. But I think you're right. Which we she are. Did agree with you? <laughs> exactly. Which you didn't agree with you. Oh, oh no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> of course not. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Julia, Julia wanted to make a point. So just, just, just briefly, yeah. I mean, obviously, it comes back to the, the pedagogy of the nation state, which we're still fighting with and um, uh, and and, and um, it, it's an issue in, in in my department in in, in London um, that you know so many of us are working beyond the nation state and yet we often find that when we're organizing our courses or, or, or dividing into groups to discuss courses we find ourselves slipping back into these categories even though it means probably less and less um, intellectually to us. Um, but I'd also draw your attention to um, very um, sort of increasingly influential and eloquent voices who are arguing for Sinophone studies um, rather than China studies, which I think is really worth paying attention to. Obviously, Sinophone, again, we have to be careful that that doesn't become something sort of too sort of rarefied and, and, and restricted, and we include all the different languages that you that you've just that you've just mentioned. Um, uh, but I think that's extremely helpful. You know, again, forcing us to engage with experience through language, through one individual writer's response to events. And I think just one or two years ago, we had um, Shu Mei Shi, Shu yes, Shumei, yes. Um, uh, from UCLA giving a lecture here um, and talking very interestingly also about her relationship with, because she's one of these big proponents with David Do Wei Wang of mm -hmm. Sinophone Studies. She was talking very interestingly about the relationship of her work to studies, with, uh, to scholars within mainland China and she felt that there was, you know, moving on from Eurocentrism or Western centrism with the rise of China, you're seeing Sinocentrism uh, within the, as, as a part of the vocabulary and preoccupations of some scholars in mainland China. So I think she and David, she and David Wang are doing really important work to keep the definition of the Sinophone, you know, the, the Sinophone <laughs> sphere diverse. 
we are about to finish, I think, and I know people will have to go back to dinner, and we have, I could go on for hours, I think, these are all very interesting questions, but I want to leave on a question. So, what do you think is going to be the most significant question in China scholarship that is going to occupy our minds for the next 10 years? Just a question. What is the question you think is important? Wow. <laughs> One, that's, a, that's in itself a wonderful question. And, and I think you're right. We can't fake by saying you're the next five. Okay, what, the one question. Um, That's a very zen we'll, approach. Yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll pose it this way. Um, and by definition, I'm, I'm not being a good China studies person because I'm not going to try to represent all of China in my question. Um, so it's a crucial question. Um, Will Xi Jinping successfully create um, a not just successful new empire, but a successful vision that will be accepted by places, for example, in Africa and ultimately even South America, the places with the main goals, um, that will be seen as an alternative to the dominant vision right now in the world? And if that happens, it will change everything else we're talking about. If it fails, it will also change everything we're talking about in radically different ways. And one way or another, um, that will, I think, be one of the central questions, not just for so-called China, but really for the world, in terms of what is going to be happening over the next decade. That's a great question. Julia? Yeah. Um, at the risk of sounding <laughs> derivative, <laughs> um, I'd like to make a related point. I'll, I'll make it um, uh, in, in, in less words and less eloquently, but you know, can China acquire soft power? I don't yeah, think China has soft yep. power, actually, at the mm -hmm. moment. Um, uh, certainly not relative to Japan, actually. The way, mm -hmm. At least uh, in terms of my very, very limited focus group, which I have, which is my, the, the friends of my teenage daughter. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, 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 I think it has hard power, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But um, it's been trying for soft power for... Um, decades, but yeah. um, you know, particularly since the 2000s, it has spent a huge amount of money on it. it hasn't managed it. Um, it's come to the fore with the China dream, but um, can it actually realise this rhetoric? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of you for being here, for being so enthusiastic. I want to thank Michael, I think it's like Simon, for hosting all this, organising this, and I think I want to thank Julia. Thank you.